So I really thank the organizers once again for this uh, invitation to this. Felicitations for Ram's six year birthday. Uh, so as I said, said by, uh, I was in Allahabad for two months uh, after just finishing my PhD and then there was this foundation stone and tree planting when uh, Ram was also there and he gave a lecture on strong multiplicity one and the Selberg context for Selberg functions. So what is, uh, what was Raghuram saying for, <laughs> oh take a Selberg function and <laughs> work with it. So anyway, uh, so later on I was, we discussed a bit in TIFR, I think I just asked him some questions, so maybe it got me a postdoc, but more than that late, and when I landed in Montreal, so Ram asked me to start by looking at uh, Langtrotter conjectures, which is, uh, we have an elliptic curve E, uh, E is an elliptic curve. So then uh, at, for every prime P, you can look at the APE, which is the number of points of the elliptic curve or a finite field uh, plus P plus 1 minus, so P plus 1 minus EF. And uh, the question is if this, uh, how this uh, APs are distributed. So Langtro, one of the Langtrotter conjectures was whether APE equal to 0, how often does this happen? The number of P's for which, and so this is a question, what is the distribution of the p less or equal to x, how does it uh, vary the number and the conjecture was that it should be kind of asymptotic to square root of, not asymptotic or it should be of the form square root of x. Uh, maybe or x power half plus epsilon, maybe it could be safe. Non-CM case, in the non-CM case, when E as non-CM. Uh, well, I couldn't make much progress on this, but then uh, we decided to change over to a relative context, or relative meaning you have two elliptic curves E1 and E2, and then you ask for the number of primes, again the same question, where AP of E1 equal to AP of E2, and then we could say something assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis for various symmetric products of the rankin silver convolution. But that was my, almost the first paper which I got in my postdoc and so that was very useful. This is a kind of introduction to the multiplicity one theorems. Okay, so then, uh, but there was also another very nice question which Ram gave me which was to bound the size of the tate shuffer which groups when of elliptic curves or function fields of finite fields uh, and uh, yeah so that was a real jump start for my career which apart from giving all the confidence and other things. So thanks. Uh, okay so now I want to talk about some strong multiplicity one results but in a spectral context so I'll So there have been various analogies which have been known between spectrum and arithmetic, between so let me start with some of these analogies. So the first uh, instance can be attributed to mass. So what recall the notion of a holomorphic modular form. Say for the group gamma not n, which is the set of elements a, b, c, d, say n divide c. So we have all these things acts on the upper of plane. 
this attacks on the upper of flame, which is x plus i y with y greater than zero. And the action is by this fractional linear transmission, so that ABCD acting on Z is AZ plus B by CZ plus B. And we say form is F is a holomorphic model of form. F is a holomorphic a holomorphic model of form. So then uh, point is it is modular in the sense that AZ plus B by of some weight CZ plus D to the power of some K times FZ of weight K. And uh, it has some uh, it's holomorphic. It's a holomorphic function. F is holomorphic. F is holomorphic. And it, uh, it satisfies some growth properties at the cusps. So this is for A, B, C, D in gamma naught m. It satisfies some growth properties at the cusps. Sorry, these are all very standard material. Okay, so what Mass did was to do the following: he dropped this condition that F be holomorphic, and it looked at functions f, functions f, which are eigenfunctions for the Laplacian. For the hyperbolic Laplacian, which is, uh, I hope it's one by y squared times. Okay, and the function also you assume it's uh, it's a uh, it's y squared, yeah. It was just maybe you can put a minus. You you just uh, yeah, it's it's a function which is invariant, an invariant function. So it's in other words, it's a, these are these are smooth functions on the upper of plane modulo the action of gamma, which I can call it as x gamma. Which are eigenfunctions for the Laplacian. Uh, so the point is that delta of f equal to some lambda times f, which satisfies this modularity property, which is invariant functions. And of course, Mass showed that okay, a corresponding Hecker theory can be developed, and uh, various analogous properties can be carried over from the context of holomorphic model forms to uh, to functions which are eigenfunctions for the hyperbolic Laplacian. Uh, and Mass also defined the real analytic Eisenstein series and many other things in this context. And so in some sense what uh, it pointed out was that there is a more group theoretic rule for the whole thing. It is not really holomorphicity but some kind of uh, H mod gamma and the geometry of these spaces which plays a role in modular form theory. Okay, so the, that is one of the beginnings of the analogy. There is another, yet another analogy which I is attributed to Selmer. So another is the the Selberg's what Selberg did was to look at again surfaces say like x gamma but let me uh, h mod of lattice and then you look look at uh, the closed geodesics so this is as you say it's a, it is a Riemannian manifold which is a hyperbolic metric uh, so you look at closed geodesics on 
on x gamma and assume they are primitive in the sense it is so geodesics are paths on the space which are locally men length minimizing and they are smooth paths and you want it to be closed which means it comes back and it is primitive in the sense you are parametrizing it for it comes back only once it is not looping around many times around itself. So those are the closed geodesics, so primitive closed geodesics. So Selberg said that primitive closed geodesics are like analogy with prime numbers. Okay, so that is so he again did a counting and showed that an analog of the prime number theorem is valid in this context. So what Selberg showed is a, there is an analog of prime number theorem, prime prime number theorem or whatever it is for closed geodesics. For the lens of closed zero six, which is that you look at pi gamma of x or pi of x gamma, pi gamma, sorry, little x, which is the collection of I denote by closed zero six. Gamma is a closed zero six. Whose uh, the length of gamma. Is less than or equal to x, or I should not say length of gamma. Uh, the norm gamma, which is e to the power length of gamma, is less than x. So this is asymptotic to x upon log x. So it's a exact analogy with the prime number theorem, where the prime number theorem is the number of primes p less than x is less than or equal to is of asymptotic to x upon log x. Okay, so that is uh, uh, Selberg's theorem which was of course generalized by Ganguly and Warner to uh, higher rank spaces or high, higher dimensional spaces. Okay, so then uh, uh, These are two, the two analogies. Uh, uh, there are some spe speculations I had about uh, the relationship between spectrum and arithmetic. So, f for instance, something like uh, if you if you are looking at x gamma, uh, suppose if they are the same spectrum, they are the same spectrum, say x gamma one x gamma 2 are the same spectrum which means they are isospectral. So will that does that imply they are the same arithmetic and so on. In the sense these spaces are also defined over some number fields k and you can look at what are called the Hasevel zeta functions. So, so saying if they have the same uh, spectrum for the Laplace operator whether they are the same arithmetic. Of course there are spaces which are known to have the same spectrum but not the same. Iso so having the same spectrum means they are you call them to be isospectral and uh, this question goes back to days of physics when you want you know the spectrum and you want to recover the the object from knowing the spectrum which is of uh, interest motivated by physics and the answer is no that yes there are spaces which are the same spectrum but they are not uh, isometric. Uh, but then the question is uh, whether they are the same arithmetic or not. Uh, okay but uh, these are uh, add these speculations but Kutla was there in the lecture and then he says do you have analogs of the strong multiplicity one theorem the arithmetic for the spectral context. Yeah, so although I grew up learning 
strong multiplicity one theorem, that question never occurred to me. So I have to thank Kudla for that. So here is a theorem. So uh, the, the work is, all the work which I'm presenting is joint work with my student, uh, ex-student Chandrashil Bhagavad. He is also in the audience. Uh, so I'm going to look at uh, Okay, so uh, see, Selberg also. Uh, so let me also say one more thing. There is a trace formula, and the Selberg trace formula relates the lengths of closed geodesics <coughs> to the eigenvalue spectrum of the Laplacian. Yeah, well, I'll say more on that later, maybe, if I have the... Before I go to the theorem, let me say... So we'll say two spaces are length isospectral. If uh, the collection of lengths of closed geodex 6 are the same, the, collection, the set of collection of lengths of closed geodex 6 are equal, counted with multiplicity. So I'm also going to look at uh, high-dimensional analogs of uh, these spaces. Uh, so instead of the hyperbolic two space, one can also look at hyperbolic n space and go more to lattices out here. The hyperbolic n space is also one can look at quotient of S O N one modulo maximal compact open subgroup modulo sub. Yeah. And you can do the same game. The prime number theorem in this case, the, this is dimension one. It will be x to the power n minus one by n minus one times log x. That is pi x, pi gamma x. Okay, so. Uh, the theorem is the following. So assume n is even. Suppose uh, the the lengths of closed geodesics or equal for all but finitely many uh, so we have I'm looking at two spaces x gamma 1 x gamma 2 I'm also assuming gamma is a co-compact or co-compact lattices or equal for all but finitely many closed zero six Finitely many. Then they are length I suspect. Actually, I should say the theorem we didn't really guess this theorem first and this thing. It's just that uh, because of what I learned about the proof of the strong multiplicity one in the Selberg class using the notion of L functions. So once I realized that there are this 
uh, analogs of L functions in this context and they have a functional equation and analytic continuation, then it was fairly clear that the proof will go through. So I'll just say what happens out here. So there is a what there is a what is called a Ruel zeta function, Ruel zeta function which can be defined. So in this case, r gamma of s is equal to product or gamma primitive. Ah, I should I should also always take lens of primitive closed geodesics if I want, but this is also okay. Gamma primitive of one minus norm of gamma to the power minus s and uh, so this is minus 1 to the power n minus 1. So it is inverse if it is even and plus 1. So that is a real zeta function it converges in some half plane and has some analytic continuation and functional equation. Now the it is a very strange fact that the, you know the functional equation looks different when n is odd and even. So we could state the theorem only for n is even uh, and the point is the functional equation if n is even it is r gamma s times r gamma minus s is some uh, let me say this it is some sine function pi s by t. Hmm. Ah. I think uh, probably all the characteristic of x comma. Okay, so that's uh, where t is some fixed positive constant. T is greater than zero, and uh, it's independent of gamma. It's some constant t, which comes from what was it? Okay, so then, uh, but for n odd, the functional equation is different. It is r gamma s by r gamma minus s. Is some exponential factor. Of s. Then uh, you do the same thing as you do in the case for. L functions are what you do in the Silver class, <coughs> which was that you look at r gamma 1 s by r gamma 2 s and if all but finitely many lengths are equal, so this becomes a product of some gammas primitives in in the primitive spectrum of gamma and some finite set, some set S1, 1 minus norm gamma to the power minus S, say n is even, so this is inverse by auto. So these are finite sets, where S1 and S2 are finite. I, I will not get more into the details of this proof, it is kind of standard. So now you use a functional equation is going to minus s and uh, what are, uh, when you use this and the fact is that the poles of this function are all on the line s equal to 0, this is sigma equal to 0, poles and zeros whereas the sine function t is positive. So this has has no polar behavior on this line and that kind of yields the fact that you know uh, these factors have to be one identically one. So once one saw that there is this rural zeta function and uh, which has this function equation it was pretty much clear that you can get a multiplicity one for the lens of closed geodesics. Uh, for hyperbolic spaces n we do not have for higher dimensions and secondly what happens is the, the there are some refinements of this work and 
been proved by using the trace formula by Kelmer and uh, in this context also he can even using trace formula or not he can only answer for n even where he can have refinements and the case n odd he can't touch so there is something mysterious happening in the case when n is odd I don't know what what's really going on there so the simplest case is hyperbolic three manifolds and the lens spectrum for that so there is some okay so this is a one of the things but uh, the spectral analog which we wanted was a different uh, kind this was this came out so easily uh, so um, for this we have to go back to the mass forms and uh, the Laplace eigenvalues So how about proving uh, some kind of uh, spectral strong multiplicity one for the Laplace eigenvalue. So uh, one way of saying it in colloquial language is that uh, it was answered by Mark Cartz is like uh, can you hear the shape of a drum you know if you see the what the notes coming out of the drum can you know what the shape is of course well, that answer is as I said is negative in the sense there are spaces which have the same sounds but not isometric but here it is like saying if you are partially deaf can you still get back the uh, to know what roughly the shape can be like sometimes you do not want to hear some things and you just say but I can still get an idea of what is happening uh, so that is but instead of looking at the Laplace eigenvalues we have a different notion of the spectrum in this context a slightly uh, different way of looking at the spectrum <coughs> different way meaning uh, it's a which is by from the point of view of representation thing using representation thing So, so this is like uh, I would say the basic analogy would be like if you are doing Fourier analysis whether you look at eigenfunctions of Laplacian delta f equal to lambda times f so this gives you f is say on r mod z the periodic functions so this will give you f is some multiples of cos n x sin n x or you want to look at the Fourier analysis by looking at functions f f of x is equal to e to the power say 2 pi i n x okay and this is n runs over all integers of course so here n is greater than equal to 0 so you can look at the Fourier expansion of a function decomposition either with respect to the exponential functions or this but these are group characters whereas these are Eigen functions for the Laplacian and for general Riemannian manifolds what generalizes is of course the Laplacian viewpoint but in the in the context of locally symmetric spaces where I said one is working with hyperbolic quotients or more generally G mod K mod gamma you can have a representation theoretic in interpretation uh, theoretic interpretation for the spectrum and that is what we are going to look at so the idea is suppose like for instance f is a mass form it is an Eigen form but associated to f you can look at so f is f of gamma g equal to f of g for gamma in this lattice gamma and then you can 
you can take this f and look at translates of this f. So you can look at f of uh, zh, zg. So call this fz of g and look at the space generated by all this. Uh, sorry, fgz. Look at the space generated by all these functions f g z. So z is in the upper half plane. For g in the group g. Okay, so this becomes a representation space for g, and uh, via this one connects the space of modular forms or mass forms to representations of g. This is uh, becomes a representation for the group G which is say SL2 or whatever it is in this context. Okay. And so you get what are called the principal series representations in this context and so corresponding to this representations you can also construct mass forms. So there is a nice correspondence between uh, and even for the other one, the holomorphic forms also, you can construct representations. So this way of looking at it is better. So what we are going to look at is G is some <coughs> semi-simple Lie group, and gamma is a co-compact lattice. And uh, so we are going to look at the space L2 G mod gamma. So this is a G space, so G X, and in the context when gamma is co-compact, this breaks up as a direct sum, just like in the R mod Z, it breaks up. This breaks up as a direct sum of some representations pi in G hat. So G hat is the collection of irreducible unity representations of G and we look at m pi gamma times some pi. So this m pi gamma are some natural numbers where this of course means union zeros and pi is the representation which one is looking at. Um, so this is, and you say that two lattices gamma 1 and gamma 2 are representation equivalent. So this is representation. The analog of isospectrality, if uh, uh, m pi of gamma 1 equal to m pi gamma 2 for all pi g hat. And the question of uh, strong multiplicity one in this context is the following theorem. Sit uh, theorem. Yeah, it's of course joint with transitional Bhagavad. So. Uh, suppose uh, all but finitely many uh, phi in G hat occur with the same multiplicity So then all pi occurs in I should say in L2 G mod gamma 1 and L2 G mod gamma 2. So then uh, m pi of gamma 1 equal to m pi gamma 2 for all phi g. 
So that's a, a representation theoretic analog, which uh, rather than looking at eigen functions of Laplacian and looking just at the eigen spectrum, uh, decided to formulate it in a representation theoretic context, and we could prove this. Um, I should say that uh, the uh, unknown to us, after we probably did it, or I don't know whether simultaneously we got to know that uh, this, in the context of SL2R and eigenvalues, for SL2R, this going between the representation and eigenvalues is uh, fairly easy. There is not much, but in the higher, for groups apart from SL2R. Uh, this information, the representation theoretic information is not the same as the eigenvalue information. It is uh, different. For SL2R, in the book of Elstrad, Grunewald and Menike, so they have uh, proofs of the multiplicity one theorem both in this context and the length spectrum, but the length spectrum is slightly different their notion of length spectrum. Uh, it is what uh, they use when it when you use the trace formula what comes up when you use the trace formula. So, they prove it and for them the, this question was raised by Veneras that they should try to prove a kind of this kinds of multiplicity one theorem in this context. Okay, uh, but that's only for SL2R for the general group. I don't think nothing much was known. There's one more uh, result one can have, uh, which is in the uh, function theoretic context for the functions on G mod K mod gamma, rather than representations. Uh, here, what happens is so this, in some sense, corresponds to multiplicity one for the spherical spectrum. So, what one does is you look at the DG is equal to the invariant differential operators. So this uh, Ritabrata also talked about yesterday. Operators on on the space of functions on G mod K and functions on uh, order the invariant differential operator. So this is a commutative algebra. I hope so. Yeah. And so it is. Uh, it is generated by self adjoint elliptic differential operators. So, because it is self adjoint, you can uh, you can do simultaneous uh, diagonalization and you can look at simultaneous eigenfunctions. Okay. So, uh, let me say that this this algebra contains the Laplacians and various other various other generalizations of Laplacians. Generalized Laplacians extra lots of operators, but in the rank one case if uh, say a so n one case uh, so this algebra is DG is a polynomial algebra on the Laplacian. Okay, so you can look at simultaneous eigenfunctions. So you take a character chi of DG to C to C an algebra homosome and look at functions uh, the eigenfunctions f v chi of gamma is equal to all these functions f which are on f is a function on uh, x gamma to c so that uh, for any operator df equal to chi d times f. 
d is in the algebra of invariant differential operators on g mod k. Okay, oh, so maybe I should put that d on g mod k. And again, you can give a analog of the strong multiplicity one theorem. So that's like looking at the Laplacian spectrum in the rank one case. Almost over. Okay. So, so anyway, I will not write down this theorem in this context. So let me say a bit of word about the proof of this. So the proof, just two minutes, is it okay? Oh, yeah. I still have. So what happens is you use the trace formula. So I should have. Okay, I don't think I have too much to say. Uh, I have little time to. So the trace formula relates, uh, see we have the relation between conjugacy classes and uh, representations. So this is the eigenvalue spectrum and this is a, the lens of closed geodesics. But that is the way of looking at the Selberg trace formula. In the context of gamma containing set G, what one looks at is the conjugacy classes of gamma and g to representations of pi occurring in L2 g mod gamma. Okay, so the trace formula will kind of tell you that you will have m pi gamma 1 minus m pi gamma 2. I will take that and then it will be the distributional character chi pi of f. It is equal to some summation of some orbital integrals. Some with some coefficients, various orbital integrals, and this is a finite sum by assumption. What one uses is a deep fact from Harishandra that this character is given by a locally integrable function. So, it, whereas the geodesic, the conjugacy classes out here are because of co-compactness, they are discrete and uh, they are of measure zero. So here, if I so. If I look at functions which are supported out here, then the orbital integrals will vanish because it does not meet this conjugacy classes. So the right hand side will vanish. So the left hand side should vanish for these functions. But this is integral of f times some function phi, where phi is by Harishandra's theorem, where phi is some this thing. So the integral vanishes on a large open set. So this function should vanish for all f. And uh, by linear independence of characters, you get the, this. The other, this proof is slightly more tricky. It involves anyway. I'll stop here.